and Homeroom across the bay here in Oakland, they had this color coded management system. The impetus was a customer inappropriately touching a waiter. What's great about it is it's very clear in terms of what somebody reports is an issue and how it's handled. I'm your host, Joy Manning, and this is Edible Potluck, a podcast that gives food lovers a taste of Edible Communities magazines. Today, we're visiting writer Sarah Henry to talk about how some restaurants in San Francisco are trying to end sexual harassment. Then we're checking in with Edible Boston editor Sarah Blackburn to talk about a very special aged maple syrup that tastes as complex as a fine wine. But first, I want to suggest a recipe for you, especially if you're stuck in a hummus rut. I mean, I love hummus, but I definitely want to change it up sometimes. Have you tried muhammara? It's a roasted red pepper and walnut paste that also hails from the Middle East. You make it by combining roasted red peppers, homemade or store-bought, walnuts, garlic, breadcrumbs, olive oil, and lemon juice in a food processor and blending it until it's a slightly coarse puree. You can add as many hot peppers, fresh or dried, as you like. I like it spicy. A little drizzle of pomegranate molasses is great on top of the finished dip or just mixed right into the food processor if you happen to have it on hand. You usually see muhammara served as a dip with pita, just like hummus, but when you whip up a batch at home, you start to see its many other uses. One spoonful really livens up a batch of salad dressing. You can put it on a burger or inside of a grilled cheese for something a little extra special. And it's a perfect dip for celery stalks or carrot sticks as a snack. A number of different edible magazines have recently featured recipes for this dish, so I think there's something about it that's just in the air. I'll give you a link or two in today's show notes. For more than a year, we've been inundated with stories of sexual harassment in the food world and across other industries. Celebrity chefs, including Mario Batali and John Besh, have stepped away from their restaurant empires in the wake of disturbing allegations. As the Me Too movement has empowered the victims of harassment to speak out, chefs all over the country have examined the type of environment they're creating for their teams. In a recent issue of Edible San Francisco, regular contributor Sarah Henry wrote about how Me Too is playing out in her city. She covers both the problem and the potential solutions with a focus on what restaurants can do to make change happen and make restaurants safer for all the workers. She's here with us today to talk more about this tough subject. Welcome to Edible Potluck, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Joy. So what made you want to write Stamping Out Sexual Harassment in the Kitchen for Edible San Fran? So I've been doing um, a series of cover stories for them over the years and working with the editor there, Bruce Cole. We wanted to, we've done a lot of stories that have looked at large industry issues that we thought that, you know, readers and diners would be interested in. We've done stories about minimum wage. Uh, we did a story about $4 toast. <laughs> um, right. You know, just uh, we've done something on the line cook shortage. And so we felt like this was a huge issue that was very much on people's minds and we wanted to see you know what what could we do to move the story along a little bit it definitely made me realize how universal this is i think of san francisco as being a really enlightened progressive place and so while on the one hand i was surprised to read that these problems are just as bad in your city as they are in mine i was not surprised to see interesting solutions coming out of san francisco i'll tell you that um i guess this is sort of the great equalizer yeah, and I and I think it's um, uh, you know some of the uh, solutions that that are coming out are they're very simple, they're grassroots based, and they're being generated by mostly women in the industry, which I think is interesting. Yeah, I mean, not surprising, but interesting. Um, and we're definitely going to talk about that. I just sort of wanted to back up a little bit because this is Edible Communities magazines, including Edible San Francisco, and this podcast are on the light and happy topic of food. I, and this sort of delves into something not so light. And I'm wondering why you think it's important for food enthusiasts and restaurant lovers to know more about this issue. Uh, that's a good question. So to start with, people typically don't come to me for this. You know, I don't tend to do the recipe-driven stories. Right. And even if I do a, you know, quote-unquote celebrity chef profile, there's usually some other... Uh, angle that we're working in that story. So, and I think our readers do care about these kinds of subjects. If edible communities folks care about how animals are treated, for example, or where their restaurant food come from, or whether workers were treated fairly when the harvesting food or producing food, then I think that, you know, they also care about how the employees are treated in the establishments they frequent. 
When you talk to readers about your stories, do you find that some of these ethical considerations impact their decisions about where to dine? Absolutely. I mean, in San Francisco, but really across the country, people, there's a certain kind of consumer who votes with their pocketbook, right? So, and that may be for a host of different reasons. They may shun certain kinds of banks um, or, Mm -hmm. and and I think that that also carries through on the food front for sure. Right. I, I think that that's important. I think that stories like yours do empower readers to vote with their pocketbooks. I know I try to take those kinds of things into considerations when I'm choosing where to spend my money in a restaurant. Now, sexual harassment is not in any way confined to the restaurant industry, but it does seem to be particularly bad there. Why do you think it affects the restaurant industry so much? Uh, I think it's a couple of things. Culturally, historically, it's been a very hierarchical, male-dominated workplace. So, you know, you're coming out of that system. There's also a culture of working very closely together under deadline pressure in heat, in the heat of the moment. And so I think that's also a factor. It's a service industry and, uh, you know, different service industries tend to have a higher frequency of sexual harassment. So I think all those things come into play. Mm. You open your story with the sort of a case study of Cabrino Grico. Am I saying that right? I, I believe so. Yeah. Cabrina. Yeah. And she, she works at uh, Josie Baker Bread, uh, home of the $4 toast that we mentioned. Yeah. And um, she had been through a very harrowing ordeal. It sounded like I read the links and I Googled some things about the backstory. And it, I mean, it sounded like she has really been through a lot. And you write that she's now trying to play a role in create uh, creating a safe environment and sort of changing the culture. And I'm wondering, um, why did she feel like that was her responsibility? And is it helping her feel better now? And I mean, is there anything else you want to say about that? So one of the things that I was not interested in doing with this story was making uh, people who had been um, the victims of sexual harassment or, or sexual assault relive their trauma. Like, I just... You know, I feel like those stories right. were already out there, well documented by, you know, a gaggle of great newspaper writers of the Times and the Chronicle and New Orleans. But I did need, you know, real people to come forward and talk about what had happened to them. I just didn't want them to relive their trauma. I didn't think that was necessary. I felt like, you know, I really wanted to do something looking at um, solutions because I also mm-hmm. feel like readers had some compassion fatigue too around this issue. I mean, we've been all hit across lots of industries with, you know, story after story about these incidents being reported. Um, and I think for Cabrina and and other folks who, who talked with me, it was really important that they didn't have to rehash the details of, you know, what incidents had happened to them, that part of their healing process was in fact um, trying to make change and in their own workplaces and to act as role models both you know at the grassroots in their in their own workplaces and also for the industry as a whole and I want to just be sure that I I say that Cabrina would be the first to say that Josie Baker of Josie Baker Bread uh, you know she's worked with for years there had never been an issue in terms of her workplace which is you know San Francisco is housed in the same workspace as uh, Four Barrel Um, and uh, the incident involving Cabrina happened off-site at a company holiday party. Yes Um, there certainly is a lot of information out there and um, you can read the whole story if you want to get into it but I was wondering if you were still in touch with her and if her efforts are first of all like working and if they're making her feel better? Uh, Yes, I've been in touch. And in fact, uh, one of the things for me that was really important about this story, regardless of reader response, was, you know, this was a tricky story to report. I did not want um, to re-traumatise these people or, you know, any. I didn't want any kind of negative impact for them speaking out again. And I think it was also healing for them to talk about it, but to talk about it in a way of, again, trying to work towards solutions. And um, I think that Cabrina feels like, uh, you know, they're doing everything that they can within their workplace to make sure that people understand what their rights are and what their responsibilities are. And so I think she feels good about the role she's playing at her workplace. That's really good to hear. Your story brought to light the difference between sort of knowing the letter of the law, you know, when you make employees watch training videos or sit through a talk and creating a a company culture that discourages harassment and discrimination. Can you sort of tell us what makes the difference there? Can you give us some examples? 
Sure. So I think one of the things that came up with talking with restaurant owners and in, in also talking with uh, labor lawyers who do this anti-sexual harassment training, it's not really enough to have a handbook and to sort of um, just go through the motions in these cases or in these workplaces. This is one restaurant chef said to me, this is something I think about every single day. And she's been a restaurant owner for 20 years in this, in the aspect, just like you think about, you know, paying your workers and, you know, all the issues that come up every single day for a restaurant. This is something that's always on the forefront for her in terms of being vigilant um, and making sure that all employees are aware, both, you know, workers and management about what is acceptable and what isn't. And if somebody comes forward with a claim, how to handle that, what the procedure is in-house. And it's it's something that a restaurant workplace deals with on a regular basis. And who is that that you're referring to? Uh, Gail Peary at Foreign Cinema was someone I spoke with who was reported in the story. She was talking about how it's, you know, it's just something that's front and center for her all the time. So it's like we're creating a culture that is meaningful, uh, is, is an everyday thing. Correct. And I mean, this term creating a culture comes up a lot. And what it really boils down to is transparent, open, responsible, fair. You know, these are just, you know, things that everybody wants in their workplace, uh, inclusive, respectful, yeah, that, that's that's not something that just you talk about for two hours at a sexual harassment training and then you go about your business. That's that's a goal to strive towards every day you open your restaurant. And I think that's definitely part of many of the solutions that you referred to in the piece. And I know that I have one particular program that I'd like you to talk about, but were there any that struck you as being really replicable um, or effective that we could you know, talk about right now? Sure. I feel like um, there are sort of three that come to mind that are very organic, authentic, that come from people who are in the trenches doing the work and that they are very simple and even modest in their um, mission and they're not going to completely reform the system across, uh, you know, in, in a hurry, but they are actually like people are trying to do, to implement change one restaurant at a time, and they're imminently replicable, which is why I wanted to include them in the piece. Yeah, I think that that might be very useful for listeners no matter where they live and whether they work in the restaurant industry or outside of it. I was especially um, interested in the solution that Homeroom implemented. Okay. And that was actually dealing with a part of harassment in the restaurant workplace I hadn't thought about before, although I should have because I've been a waitress, right. which is harassment from the customers. Yes. And Homeroom across the Bay here in Oakland, um, they have this color-coded system, management system that they introduced. Very simple. As you said, it came uh, from a meeting with the owners and the staff and it was the impetus was um, a customer inappropriately touching a waiter and management, which was mostly male at the time, even though most of the employees were female at the workplace, not not really um, being sure about how to handle it. And it's a very simple color-coded system. Would, would you like me to walk through it? Yeah. yeah. Can you describe it? Sure. So uh, what's great about it is it's very clear in terms of what somebody reports is an issue and how it's handled. There's very clear, and, and the staff came up with this together with uh, the owners. Um, so yellow, if you if you tell your you're a you're a waiter, um, and you tell your manager, I've got a code yellow happening on table two. That means leering, creepy behaviour, and the manager will ask if you'd like to, you know, be removed from serving that customer. And that's the choice at, at that point is uh, with the waiter whether they remain or not. But like it's a you know it's a flag for people who are watching that situation. Code orange would be unwelcome comments and that means immediately the manager takes over that table no questions asked uh code red is for repeated code orange violations or inappropriate touching or overtly sexual comments and that customer is actually asked to leave the restaurant very simple very clear and they've had a, a lot of success with that um you know they've had it uh, some issues and they haven't had issues since they implemented the system. Everyone's on board. And in fact, um, the owner, Erin Wade, told me that she's getting a lot of interest from both other restaurants, but other service industries about how to implement in their workplace. It is very simple, but that no questions asked part of it, that's, I think, the magical part of it, because I think people hesitate to 
you know, get into a big thing with their manager. Um, and if you know that you're not going to be interrogated about an exchange, you're much more likely to report it. That's what I thought was sort of the simple the simple genius of it. And I really hope that that spreads as an idea. Absolutely. And also, like, let's be real, you're in the restaurant industry. It's busy. People are moving fast. And, you know, this is a very quick, convenient way where nobody has to explain themselves. It's, as I said, it's very clear about what's going down and what needs to happen. And I think it takes some of the pressure off managers too, frankly, Sure. who may not be, you know, they're not at the table. They're trying to assess the situation in a busy work environment. Um, so I think it works well, I understand, for both, both sides. It's certainly something that I wish I would have had when I was working in a restaurant. Absolutely, right? Honestly, yeah. it was a long time ago, but it never even occurred to me that freedom from harassment from customers was something that would be available to me as like a 20 something waitress, you know, um, which is, I'm glad that times have changed and that things like this exist now. Exactly. And I think any of us that have worked in the industry, you know, we've all got stories about um, these situations. And what I find really interesting is the timing of, you know, it, this is all, obviously all these reports have come out in the past year. A lot of these allegations were not new. People knew that there was behavior that was inappropriate. Right. And I, and I think that often it's timing in terms of whether um, people are willing to mobilize around an issue that, you know, sexual harassment in restaurants, there's no news in that. If I'd pitched that story uh, as a freelancer, I don't know how many editors might have been interested in that you know, a couple of years ago, even mm -hmm. before it became such a big topic in the correct. Yeah. The nationwide conversation. Exactly. Now there is one more thing I want to cover today about your story, which is this topic of whether it's possible and how it might happen that harassers can return to leadership positions as chefs or restaurant owners in the industry. You talked about a specific case in your article of a chef accused of harassment who actually has already gone on to open a new restaurant. Correct. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened there and how the community is responding to it? Sure. So I think this is the sort of fascinating next uh, series of stories around. And there have been, you know, quote unquote, redemption stories coming out very early on for several celebrity chefs who have been accused of this behavior and with very conflicted responses from within the industry and from diners. Uh, in the case you're mentioning, Charlie Hallowell, who uh, is a restaurant owner in Oakland, he had three restaurants, was accused by 30 plus women in an uh, excellent piece by Tara Duggan from The Chronicle and others reporting on what happened there. He was out of the mix for a year, but at the time that he was accused, he had a restaurant that was being developed in Berkeley, neighboring Berkeley, um, which is recently opened. And it's been controversial to say the least. And it's fascinating to watch how people are handling the situation. And his initial sort of re-entry back into the uh, community, as it were, was at our local farmer's market. There's a Tuesday market in Berkeley that is frequented by lots of chefs from Berkeley, Oakland, and San Francisco. And his presence there caused something of an outcry. It was reported in the Chronicle uh, with some people feeling like it was too soon for him to come back. And then he also issued an apology and then he issued an apology to his apology because it seemed tone deaf to a lot of people. There was something about there was going to be a dunk tank where you could, you know, if he behaved inappropriately or said stupid things, you could like dip him in water once a month. And I think it was supposed to be a joke, but it really didn't go over well. It doesn't sound too sensitive. Correct. Um, and so I think it really raises the larger issue. And I think a lot about this because, um, and I don't have the answer. I think it's an ongoing conversation for people. And again, I think in the end, people vote with their pocketbook. I know some people who will never frequent that restaurant. Um, I know some that have already been. And there are people who feel like, somebody who was in a position of power who did these things or allegedly did these things should not be in that kind of position of power in a restaurant again. There's, you know, that would be one school of thought. And then another might be, well, how do we rehabilitate? What kind of restorative justice are we talking about here? And then, of course, people argue, well, what about the restorative justice for the 30-plus women who were subjected to his behaviour? So I think this is the story that will evolve over time. It'll be interesting to see when this new restaurant is finally reviewed. We have a new food critic had the Chronicle jumping on board in January. I'm wondering if she will review this restaurant, and if so, 
will this be part of the story? Um, I'm glad it's a woman. I feel like we don't have enough women restaurant critics. Right, right. It'll be interesting. In fact, I haven't seen a review of this restaurant as yet. It's just literally opened, I I, I don't know, I want to say in the last month. Uh, There have been stories, of course, about its opening and there are a couple of actually industry people um, on social media really going after whether people should frequent this restaurant and it's going to be an ongoing debate. Well, I'm looking forward to your follow-up cover story on this issue and all your future stories. I don't know what the next four dollar toast in san francisco will be but i know you'll probably write about it (laughs) and i really appreciate you joining us today sarah thank you so much it's been such a pleasure to talk to you thank you for having me joy appreciate it that was sarah henry a freelance writer and author of farmsteads of the california coast she's also the co-author of the juhu beach club cookbook and hungry for change for the berkeley food institute We'll share the link to her article, Stamping Out Sexual Harassment in the Kitchen, in the show notes for this episode. Follow her on Twitter at SJHenryWriter. Most of us have eaten plenty of pancake syrup, that corn syrupy stuff you buy on the cheap at the supermarket. But if you're interested enough in food to be listening to this podcast today, you probably long ago upgraded to real maple syrup with its dramatically richer flavor. But did you know you could level up again? In Boston, a small company called Cask Force is aging quality maple syrup in barrels to create complex layers of flavor that rise above the level of pancakes. The syrups were featured in a recent issue of Edible Boston, and we've got editor Sarah Blackburn here to tell us more. Welcome to Edible Potluck, Sarah. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm curious, how did you discover these syrups? They're, they seem very interesting and different. Uh, can you can you tell us how they came to your attention? Yes. So the Cask Force HQ is actually in my town, which is Wayland, Massachusetts, which is about 20 miles west of Boston. And it's based inside a liquor store, which is called Post Road Liquors. Um, it's pretty unassuming from the outside, not really unlike most of our uh, package stores here in Massachusetts. It's got fluorescent lights, it's got Doritos, it's got the lottery, it um, has nips and Slim Jims. But once you take a really good look at their inventory, um, you'll see that it's not really a standard packy at all. It's got an exceptional selection of French wine, a burgundy section that is phenomenal, um, and a whole wall devoted to local craft beer and cider and a really esoteric artisan liquor and local spirits collection. So their main business is wine cellar curation, um, and they help stock customers. Wine cellars were in sort of an affluent area, so they do a lot of wine delivery, and they really fill up um, people's cellars with hard-to-find vintages from all over Europe. But this, the younger generation of this family business, um, which also owns two other package stores closer to Boston, one in a couple in Newton, started this project. So it was Nick and Mike O'Connell brothers, uh, along with their cousin Dave and their wine buyer, Taylor, who began cask aging liquor. And that's what cask force is. Um, they experimented by putting different liquors in different barrels to age and take on the flavors of what was there before like bourbon in porter barrels or a local hard cider in uh, a whiskey barrel. And so they reached out to distilleries in the U.S. and uh, in Europe and even Japan for some whiskey barrels to get flavor profiles that they thought would really match the liquors that they wanted to age inside them. But it was Nick who started this syrup project, which um, is what you wanted to talk about today. <laughs> right. Well, we I read it in, um, you know, your magazine. It, it was uh, a really fascinating look at the way uh, something like maple syrup really could be um, made more complex and sort of more analogous to the type of right. spirits or even uh, wines. They In the article, it's uh, described like a wine tasting, the way the, mm-hmm. the syrups are, are sampled. Um, do you know why they decided to branch into syrup from um, spirits? <sighs> Well, it was a project that Nick had close to his heart. He had been traveling up to Vermont often to look for um, beer producers, primarily. Um, And he stopped at, he loves maple syrup, and he stopped at this particular maple farm, and he developed a relationship with them. He, let's remember, like, is a wine guy, right? Mm -hmm. So taste and terroir are extraordinarily important to him. This particular maple farm is to him, the best producer of maple syrup in the whole country. And what's the name of the farm? 
I'm sorry. That's one thing I don't have. He does not advertise the name of it. He's got um, this great relationship with them because they're large enough that he's able to expand his business as it grows. Mm -hmm. Um, But when I ask him about maple syrup in Massachusetts, especially in our town, a town next door to us, there is a a town subsidized organic farm that collects sap from all over town from different people's properties. It has a relationship with the middle school. The sugar shack is on the property of the Weston Middle School. And the kids sugar off from the beginning of, you know, as soon as the sap starts running all the way through the process of bottling. So I asked him, why are you not using Massachusetts syrup? That's something I wondered too. Yeah. And his response was, terroir. I love the the high ledge forest, the taste of this particular syrup. I've never tasted syrup that that I like better. And that's why I use this syrup. Simple as that. Well, that's a very legitimate reason. And it, <laughs> yeah. it certainly, it's not like Vermont is not a regional product for, for you all in Boston. Correct. Correct. Plus, all, all of the value add of this product is mm-hmm. occurring inside this package store on the Boston Post Road mm-hmm. in Wayland, which I find really fascinating. Um, so what does that um, process that they're doing um, right there, the barrel aging, what does it do to the syrup, which is uh, so good to begin with? You know, it sounds like he really loves right. the, the taste as it is. So what does the aging add? So the syrup will take on the unique characteristic of both the wood that the barrel is made out of and whatever was aged inside there before. So it it is a nuance that's hard to describe without tasting it. To me, it's sort of like the the essence of the liquor without the liquor, hmm. if that makes sense. So well, that I, really appeals to me. And honestly, one of the reasons this jumped out to me is I um, stopped drinking alcohol myself a couple of years uh, ago, yeah, yeah. but I still love interesting beverages. And as soon as I saw it, I thought that probably would be a great um, tool in my arsenal of non-alcoholic drink making. Absolutely. So I also asked him, how do you know when it's ready? You know, mm-hmm. how, how do you know if the syrup has taken on enough of those characteristics? Like he'll put the, um, he, he puts a syrup into bourbon and rye, for instance. And mm-hmm. then there's another one, which he calls Delicato, which he puts into a, um, a single malt scotch barrel. That Delicato only ages for six weeks because the spicier, stronger flavor of the single malt really gets into the syrup faster than than the bourbon and rye, which takes about 10 weeks to develop. So I said, do you, do you taste it along the way? How do you know when it's ready? And he said um, that he doesn't. It's It was a guess at the beginning. And he really... Um, he he hammers the tap into the cask so that he can agitate and roll the cask around to mm-hmm. really get all the flavor out of it. And if he just had the rubber thing in there, it would probably um, leak out everywhere. So he doesn't really know until he's about to crack the cask to you know to open it up and know um, and bottle it that it that it's really taken on all the flavors that it can. And so you said um, that one particular type is only aged for six weeks. Mm-hmm. How what's the upper end of aging? Do you have a sense? Ten weeks. Ten, Ten weeks. weeks. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So six to 10 altogether. Um, it doesn't take a particularly long time. Um, and he has a few different barrels going all the time and he does it in a temperature controlled environment mm-hmm. in the back of the store. Um, the article includes some really interesting examples of how people might use these syrups in their home cooking, such as a finishing touch on something like roasted Brussels sprouts or drizzled on popcorn or even ice cream. Um, have you been using these syrups at home at all? And if so, how do you like to use them? I have been, if I can get them out of the clutches of my children who like to put, <laughs> put it on everything. And so again, like, yes, it is, it is not an alcoholic product. It is totally okay for everybody to eat. Right. Um, I love it on Brussels sprouts, obviously. I drizzled it on top of an apple crostata at Thanksgiving. It's fantastic on roasted duck breast with a lot of garlic and thyme, but it's it's also just a, a very special flavor on something as neutral as Greek yogurt or oatmeal with a lot of butter on it. Um, anywhere where you would use maple syrup and you want to do something a little bit more special. That sounds like a real treat. Um, yeah. Drizzled on Greek yogurt, something very simple. You could do that would feel very special. I love right. something like that. Yeah. Um, and ice cream too. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is certainly a d- dessert product, but because it has some of those little other nuances of bourbon or rye, it, it's got some bitterness too. So it works with savory things. Now, because of its close affinity for, um, you know, its close relationship to spirits and wine because of the business owners and the way it's produced, um, it must be popping up in cocktails around town and maybe even mocktails. Uh, have you seen it being served? 
Yes, it sure is. And um, there's one bar in particular, the Hawthorne, which is in Kenmore Square near Fenway Park, which is one of our city's first sort of real craft cocktail lounges. Um, they've been using not only the syrup, but they also use a lot of the cask force liquors in their uh, in their recipes. And the second one, a new a new bar called uh, Shore Leave, which is a tiki bar in the South End, which is uh, run the the bar the bar program is run by a woman named Gwen Haggerty, who we actually profiled in our most uh, recent issue, the Winter 2019 issue. Um, and she uses it in one of her large format cocktails, which is like a big punch made for four to six people, and she blends a bottle of champagne, some fig infused rum and cognac, Benedictine, the aged maple syrup and ginger, um, which sounds absolutely incredible. And I can't wait to get in there with a few friends. <laughs> that also sounds like a real one of a kind flavor profile, you know, something yeah. that you can sort of only sample there because of the, those two products that are, you know, aged absolutely really interesting. absolutely and they also sell that syrup the syrup there too so you can taste it in a cocktail and then go buy a bottle and bring it home with you that's really cool um so it isn't just maple syrup that they're aging in um these casks i read that there's also a, a local honey that is aged in a sa sauternes cask um have mm -hmm. you sampled that I have. I have a jar of it on my counter actually right now and I use it on my toast. What does butter. it taste like? What is it like? So it has a little bit of a tang, a slight sourness to it. Um, but just like Sauterne pairs so beautifully with blue cheese, um, like as most dessert wines do, this honey is absolutely incredible on blue cheese. It's not a dribbly honey. It's a little bit crystallized. So I mm. sort of wipe it on a piece of cheese before I put it in my mouth. That sounds um, amazing. It is. It is so beautiful. And it goes really nicely with blue, local blue. I love it with Bailey Hazen, which comes from Vermont. But then there's a, um, a very stinky, sticky uh, washed rind cheese out of Martha's Vineyard from Grey Barns, which is called Proof Rock. And it just goes so perfectly with that honey. That sounds wonderful. I, I really, I need to try some of that. Um, I, I just, I am a big fan of cheese and honey and that just sounds like taking it to another level. Right. It's just, it's absolutely delicious. So it, has anything happened with Cask Force since the article was published? Are there any updates or things on the horizon for them? So there's a couple of exciting things they've been doing. They, they, partnered with a distillery on the North shore who makes rum in Ipswich and they procured a barrel, a cognac barrel from France for them. And they're aging for three years, a rum inside that cognac barrel. So we won't know for a couple of years how that comes out. I'm sure it will be incredible. Um, they also made a bourbon blended with actual coffee, not just aged in a barrel taking on the flavors of the barrel. This is actual coffee blended with bourbon from a local coffee roaster at a town on the other side of us uh, called Sudbury, which is uh, Karma Coffee. And that's bottled under the Cask Force label, and um, it has the logo of both businesses. It's a really nice combination there. And then since recreational marijuana is now legal in Massachusetts, they're working on, uh, Nick especially is working on a um, cannabis-infused maple syrup. So that will be within the next several months, I believe. Really interesting stuff there. I guess we'll need to check back often to Edible Boston to see if you all have any further news there. Um, Absolutely. And you can buy all of it through their website, which is nice. Great. Yeah. I love to get a little taste of another town um, when I can't visit to um, sort of travel with my taste buds, so to speak. Um, well, thank you so much for being with us today. It was really great to get sort of a more backstory on Cask Force. Thank you for having me. That was Sarah Blackburn, editor of Edible Boston. We'll have a link to her article about Cask Force in today's show's notes. You can keep up with Edible Boston at Instagram and Twitter at Edible Boston. Thank you for joining us today on Edible Potluck. Our podcast producer is David Wolf. If you like this episode, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Please take a moment to leave us a rating or a review. You know it helps other listeners find the podcast. Don't forget to pick up a copy of your own local Edible magazine. If you don't know where to get one, find out at ediblecommunities.com. You can find links to everything we talked about today in the show notes for this episode at ediblecommunities.com slash podcast. Until next time, remember, eat local. Eat local.